Uh, we were talking uh, about the church again, that we are the church and uh, the universal church of Christ. And then we have our local congregations that we refer to as the church. So uh, we've been comparing those things in the last couple of weeks. So uh, tonight we'll conclude uh, that section. So before we go any further, uh, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we're going to thank you and praise you for tonight and the privilege and the opportunity of being here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, that you have your way in our hearts and lives tonight and that we would uh, be aware of your presence in this place. Be with those souls at home looking and watching on the internet, Lord God. Uh, may they sense the spirit of Christ in their midst as they study to show themselves approved of you, workmen that needed not to be ashamed. Now bless this time, Father God, we pray. And we remember Brother John tonight that you continue to touch him in his body. Well, we think of James and Hector who need transplants. And there are others in our group that are sick and uh, need your touch in their lives. So we ask that you do that. Uh, not because uh, of who we are, but because who you are, you are the healer. And we thank you, we praise you for it, Father. We thank you for your love, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, uh, again, we want to welcome everybody here to, our, to the church. And we ask that uh, you just have your Bible with you, with you that you get ready to uh, read the scripture for us and to uh, get involved with uh, the Bible study. And we're going to continue our study on the church. And we came to the conclusion that uh, the word Ecclesia, Ecclesia, uh, or excuse me, Ecclesia, i got to get my Spanish and my Greek history down here, that means the universal church the, of the body of Christ consisting of all believers of all uh, races, nationalities, uh, ethnicities, and cultures. That if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are part of that uh, church, of the church being uh, led by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So we would love to talk tonight a little bit about the mission of the church. I know lots of people one day they come to a point in their life and say, why am I here? What, what purpose do I have? Some of our young people, uh, as early as high school, sometimes in college, uh, wonder, okay, what am I supposed to do? And we uh, need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we need to know what he expects of us as uh, believers and members of the body of Christ. And so we're going to look at, so the mission of the church, what is the church supposed to do? Now, uh, why don't we just throw it out for a question, what do you, and leave your answer short, so we have time for my answer. And so, uh, what is your understanding as a member of the body of Christ and a member of the church uh, what is expected of you? What does what does God expect of you? To spread the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Amen. Now that's Matthew. Amen. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have had that. Either. No. They, he had a question of character, but the Lord took him and used him anyhow. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Is, is there other purpose for the church? And we as individuals? No, we can't all get up there and take Pastor Moses' place down the pulpit. Well, uh, by inference, Jesus said, they'll know that you're my disciples because of your love one for another. Okay, so we're expected to love one another. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I know I've heard people talk, you know, riding the bus, I hear a lot of things and waiting for the bus. Sometimes people talk about their experience with the church, and that uh, there was no love there. Um, when they lost a family member, there was no support for them. And uh, 
Some of them, the pastors were even letting them have to deal with the church. They said, well, this is the great side. And so we need to have love. The Bible, my Bible says love to one another. And it's not just for, but it's to, meaning we put that love into action. And we see someone hurting. I know you see a little kid, for example, in the natural, a little kid falls down and, and scratches his knee. You know, as, there's that one drop of blood there, it's a big thing, right? And we as adults are, should be there to say, ah, it's going to be all right, kid. You know, and mothers and fathers are going to kiss their arrows and make them feel better. And so that's love. That's That's an interesting joke. And we have people in the body try to fall and skin their knees, so to speak. And we need to be there to encourage them. Um, I remember reminded of a little girl named Mindy. She was like six or seven years old. And she had been given her first bicycle, no training wheels. And she was trying to ride this thing up and down the sidewalk in front of her house. And she kept falling down. And so uh, the, the mother was washing dishes at the kitchen. And she could look out the kitchen window and see Mindy. And saw she fell down again. Then she saw Mindy pick up the bike. And she heard her praise. Hey, Jesus, I'm just a little girl, but I need there to ride this bike. Please help me to ride the bike. And she got up, jumped back on the bikes, and she rode on down the street without another incident after that. But so they about the faith of a child. Amen? Yeah. Oh, boy. I lost my hand. <laughs> And I lost my notes again. Oh, that's the screen. All right. I don't know why I showed up two different screens than if it did. So we have a purpose. And so we want to look at the five purposes of the church. Uh, we know there are five uh, talks about gifts of the spirit of believers and preachers, teachers and prophets, etc. Imagine this. But let's look at this. Someone read for us, please, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. You folks at home, pick up your Bible, you go to Matthew 22, 37, and somebody in your group there, in your living room or wherever it is, uh, have somebody read that. Uh, and if you're Spanish speaking, I can read it in Spanish, you're Italian, you can have read it in Italian. But we're going to look at the English Standard Version. And who would like to read that for us? Jesus replied, Love the Lord, Lord God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. True verse 40. This is the first and greatest commandment, and, this, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. So all of the law and all the prophets are hanging on those. In other words, they are, that's the basis for all of it, it's, as we love one another. I for the time of life you can make it and got you across it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like it for tomorrow. All right. Hey, we're on the five purposes of the church, and uh, we have to read Matthew 22, 37 to 40. And it's talking about how uh, the two great commandments one that we are to love our neighbors as a person, and then love the Lord your God with all your heart. And I just hung up on you. you know. The teacher said to silence your phones. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to tell you to silence your phone. Anyhow, uh, now we need to love the Lord. How do we love the Lord? Through praise. Praise. And so we pray then. 
you know, if you love your spouse or your kids, so you let them know you're proud of them and uh, what they've done. Kid gets it. Hey, run. Kid gets it. A on his uh, last test, so he went, oh, wow, we can put that in the refrigerator. And love it. Okay. Uh, and recognizing them and their abilities is all part of that. But love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. So the total man or woman has to be committed to loving the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want you to uh, circle the word, the phrase, love the Lord, on their own paper. And then love your name. Can you circle those two phrases? Love the Lord and love your name. Okay, so we talked about loving the Lord. Now it says, love your neighbor. Now notice it doesn't say, love only those who aren't parents. You know, there are no, there are no exceptions as to who that we are to love. And uh, we could have some uh, modern Nazis in the next door. We still have to love them. And uh, I see on, on the internet this one guy that has such a love for people that he's not even a professional gardener, but he looks for houses where the lawn is unkept. And he goes and knocks on the door and says, hey, let's just drive by and notice your yard is kind of a mess and really need to get mowed or something. And I'd be glad to do that for free. And that's the way of his expressing the love of Jesus. And I'll tell you, uh, there's one of them I saw on TV the other day or on the internet, and it took him two days to clean up the yard and having all this power equipment there, right? For, uh, riding a lawnmower and uh, clippers and all this and that, and chainsaws, and where he, uh, where there are trees and they had suckers growing up, you cut the suckers down or just cut the tree down, depending on what condition it was in. But that was his love for his neighbors. A complete stranger walk up to him and say, Hey, John, do you mind if I cut your grass for you? See, you're having a little problem, and I'd like to help you out. And I, I knew a lady that was her ministry, it's law, mowing grass and stuff for seniors. So the various ways, but then it said, as yourself. You know, if you've never really been loved, it's kind of hard for you to express love. Uh, I know my father, he was raised in an orphanage so he was 16. His, his father, my grandpa, ran away from home and said the word bad thing to him. My, that my grandfather, grandpa said the word bad thing, he died and got hit by a car up in Canada, and it died. So that was his way of running away. But, you know, so he, Grandma had a whole bunch of kids, and they were farmers, so you, you raise your own farm help on the farms, and some parts of the country, they still do that. So, she put the two youngest ones in the orphanage, and the orphanage was crowded, and there wasn't very much love there. You know, they got their meals and a roof over their head, and, uh, there were so many kids who didn't have enough people to work with them and be um, kind to them. So he didn't know, he didn't experience love, which means he didn't know how to express love. And that's why he wasn't much of a father until uh, he got into his 70s. And of course, by then we were all grown up. So, but yet on the phone, I would call and tell him I love him. There would be just a silence on the other end of the phone because he didn't know how to respond to that. And uh, I had a brother, David, it was the same way. Uh, a couple days before I died, I, I called and talked to him and also said, you know, I love you. And it was just silence. As a matter of fact, I have a brother in the Bay Area who's a Christian, and uh, I get the same reaction from him. And he's a believer. 
and I'm telling them I love them. Because that word was never used in their home. It doesn't mean they didn't love us, <laughs> but they didn't know how. And sometimes it's hard on us trying to love people, uh, especially if they come from a different culture or whatever, speak like because we don't understand them. We don't know why they do what they do. Uh, you know, it's that way with people of faith. I know a lot of people, for example, have a hard time loving a Catholic neighbor because they see him a genuflect or whatever, and they don't understand what that's all about. But that's a little bit of worship for them when they do that in, in a perfect time. So we need to love other people the way we want to be loved. That's what it points down to. So, so we're going to read another verse, two verses. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Again, in folks at home, it's Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Who would like to read that for us? All right. Okay. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, in the King James Version, it doesn't say always. It says always without the end with the how the S on the end. And that's a little that's a little more than always. But it means from here to eternity I'm gonna love you. And regardless of what happens between us, I'm still gonna love you. So it has that thing in there that the love is unconditional. Uh, some of us refer to that as agape love, or agape, as some people pronounce the Greek word. But loving unreservedly. You know that's you know that how it is when you have a, a brand new baby or grandbaby, you know, he's just loving the pieces. And so they haven't crossed you yet. <laughs> they, they haven't been disobedient yet. And I, I remember uh, my number two daughter, Michelle, I went to the hospital, you know, and I was there for her birth. And uh, as I picked her up for the first time, she went all over me. <laughs> so that's a fancy uh, way to greet your father for the first time. But she's a real sweetheart. She turned out all right despite all that. So now I want to serve a couple more things in this verse. Verse 19 says, go there and make disciples. Now this is what Daniel was referring to earlier about. Uh, our responsibility as a believer. Go therefore and make disciples. Can you circle that? Then circle, baptizing them. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them. Then in the next verse is uh, teaching them to observe. In other words, uh, making disciples of them. So we need to get them to make, we need to go and make disciples. And it's not saying just our family or just people, people whose kids go to Sunday school, but is it uh, our church we do, and I believe Daniel's involved in this still, and the pastor, and uh, sometimes there's like five or six, sometimes there's 15 people go out on Saturday into the neighborhood around the church and door to door, not not merely inviting people to the church, but inviting people to come to Christ, uh, offering to pray with them and for them in whatever situation it might be. And so we're going to go out there and we're going to lead them to Christ. Then we are going to be the examples for Christian. People learn best by example, and uh, we we see that. Our kids do what we do. Matter of fact, uh, even our spouses sometimes pick up on our traits. Uh, being a pastor, I, I didn't want to cuss. <laughs> so uh, I, I pointed the phrase, well, they can just go and suck raw eggs for all I care. I don't know if you suck on a raw egg or ate one. 
It's not very pleasant. Uh, and I used that phrase, it's just one day I just used it, and I used it for many, many times after that. And when I lived in Avalon, I called my wife on the phone, and she was having some problems with somebody. And she said, well, they just go suck all things. Uh, she pick on it. But our kids pick up on these things too. So we need to be careful. So uh, we have a formal teaching, like a Sunday school class, and we have the informal teaching is the living room class, where we're teaching in our living room or a sports game that uh, we teach them that uh, just because the other team got run or, or caught that fly ball, we don't cut them out. You know, we love them anyhow. So we're not going to teach them. We're making disciples of them. The student, the word for the disciple is a student. And it's disciples of all nations. That's why we say they're missionaries. Now, now, uh, I'm not sure whether our church has said missionaries that they support on the foreign field. Not specifically that I'm aware of. Yeah. I know uh, well, uh, the Johnson and I belonged to had sent another church, and they had several missionaries. And once in a while they'd come, and they would uh, share in our Sunday school class. And that's back to uh, one couple of names, Snyder. <laughs> and uh, I always call him cousin instead of brother. Cousin Snyder. And... Uh, but we send out missionaries. We can't always go ourselves. Uh, when I was in the military, uh, he, I was in the home board of the ship, and we were going to different ports. We asked who has missionaries in that town. And the idea is that we're going to go, we're going to encourage them if we can. And so some people say, oh, well, I got one here in Hong Kong, or I got one here in Singapore, or wherever it might be. And we go and we go to a church service with them. And I remember in Hong Kong, I went to uh, one of those Orchard Gospel Church on the Palm Peninsula, and the pastor greeted us and talked with us and asked me if I wanted to give my testimony. So I was able to share with all those Chinese people that were worshiping together in Lord Jesus Christ. But it's all nations. So you know, we, we think about what's going on in the, in the Far East and about uh, Israel and their battles and so forth. And uh, those terrorists, we need to love them. We need to love them. And that might be a little harder, but you know, one way to love them from here is we can pray for them. Pray that they come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is teaching them. To observe all things, we start teaching them. We're teaching them. So we go, we baptize, which we ask them to follow the ordinance of the church, and we teach them to be obedient to everything that Christ has commanded them. So, if the church is supposed to teach other people to do everything that Christ commanded them, then that means we should be doing everything that the Lord commanded the early church. So we are responsible, as the saying goes, to carry the ball, carry the ball, and to go forth and set the example. Uh, I think I shared this with you one time. I was in a man's home, and his teenage son, they got into a verbal altercation. And the son said some things and had an attitude that the son shouldn't have towards their, their father. And he stormed off. And the father looked at me and says, Now, what did I do to, to deserve all of that? And I thought, Well, he's just the following example of how you talked to your mother yesterday when I was here in your home. He's following your example. And the kids will follow our examples. Uh, I know when uh, little, oh, what's Jeffy's baby's name? Melody. Melody, when little Melody was born, I looked at her and I said, you know, there's only one thing wrong with this kid. You know, so you know, what is it? I had no attention. 
So she's going to grow up to like a, just like her parents. Whatever her parents do, she's going to find that as the norm. And this is true in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I know uh, my son, uh, he's a, has a ministry. Uh, he's a pastor, so he's not tied down with a wife and kids, and he can go and do whatever he needs to do for the Lord. And I just praise God for that. Matter of fact, all of my kids are in some type of ministry, teaching Bible studies or what have And they've gotten my son-in-laws into it, which is great, too. Okay, so we know this, uh, that we're going to do those very things. First thing we're going to do, we're to love the Lord and love our neighbor as ourself. Then we're to go and baptize, uh, teach, and, and disciple people who are needed. Uh, as to baptize them, I have them to formally and publicly acknowledge Jesus Christ in their life. And then we need to teach them to observe or to do all those things that Christ has taught the church. So, uh, we are to follow the canon example. I found that Jesus did, did not ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do first. We know that he loved, because we know he wept over Lazarus. You know that he was compassionate. He saw a blind, blind man, and he laid hands on another blind man. Then he picked up the third on the ground, spit him and made a little mud out of him, put it on the man's eyes and healed him. So he, had, he was a person of compassion. And he didn't ask him about if he paid his tithe or did you go to church on Sunday. Uh, he, he didn't ask, ask him any of those questions that sometimes we, even we may not verbalize it. We look at somebody and we try to figure out how serious they are about the Lord. Well, he doesn't come on Wednesday night, you know? And he's got a vehicle to get there. His wife and kids would come with him if he came. But you don't know what he's going through. Like right now, we have one brother, his wife, has had a compound fracture of her leg. And she, I hope she's doing a little better, but there for a while she couldn't get up and go to the bathroom by herself. So he would have to pick her up and take her to the bathroom so she could use the restroom. And so he was really just taking, spoiling her, really. And, but, you know, people that miss this brother say, well, why isn't he here? He ought to be here. You know, he ought to be here. Well, he needed to be with his wife and the minister and the lover. That's what he needed. And he was setting that example for his children. That you love your spouse it doesn't mean you don't have disagreements with them, but you love them regardless. It's a, a, a love that sometimes is unrequited love, but we do it anyhow. So, next thing we're supposed to do is we're to love God with all of our heart. Somebody, maybe Brother Joan, would you do this? Find Exodus 28 41. Exodus 28, 41. <clears throat> so you shall put, oh, read it? Yes, please. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his son, and on his son with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests. Amen. So this is the Lord speaking, and he's given an instruction, and he's saying, do all these things so that people can worship me. All those things that he was asking them so that we might worship. And, and we're to love God, remember, with all of our heart, and that's worship. You know, some people have a little conception of what worship is. I, I read uh, one author's book, and he was saying that when you uh, help an old lady across the street, that that's worship. Or you comfort a child along the way, that that's worship. Well, no, it's not. Because the worship, the, the word worship, 
in the original language means to bow down, pay obedience to or to to uh, praise and to thank them for the goodness. And we worship kind of in music, and we we sing, "I love you, Lord," and you know, and I lift my voice. We're worshiping, we're honoring Him in praise and worship. And you know that as couples, uh, the king and, and queen of the home have to pay homage to one another. They need to recognize one another. They need to recognize the benefits of the relationship. Now we know that uh, we have a relationship with God and we need to thank us as part of the worship. Thanking the Lord, acknowledging Him as who He is and asking Him to just minister to love us, but we need to worship Him and praise Him as we do for our spouses. Uh, we are the men to, when a, a woman fixes a nice meal and, and it's not burned, uh, uh, we need to praise her. Say, man, you're getting to cook, you know. Like especially if your mother was a good cook and you eat your mother-in-law's food, you say, "Eh, you're you're a better than your mother." You know, that's a good thing. Where is activism in here? Uh, it's not on. I'm not sure. Okay. I didn't see it. Okay, never mind. Well, I guess I messed up and I left the house. But it's in the Bible. So then uh, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, first we have worship. But as we loving our neighbor, this is ministry. This is reaching out and touching other people. Uh, we know that. Uh, when we have a family in our church and there's a death in the family and uh, what we do is we reach out to the family. See, the memorial service isn't for the deceased. The memorial service is for the survivors. And we are there to minister to them and to reach out to them. And there are other types of ministry. Uh, we had vacation Bible school here. That's a ministry. We had a door-to-door evangelism that the ministry and it's amazing matter of fact uh brother uh by the not here but this guy has the ministry he's the one that kind of fixes the broken things around here and uh, all you have to mention is do is mention something uh, for example at one time they were having a toilet paper for the men's restroom and I said, oh, did you know? There's no final paper in the men's restroom. I'll get right on it. And he went and got some. I wasn't telling him what to do. I was letting him know there was a need. And I know that Pastor does with him that sometimes because he knows that that fat man's ministry is uh, making sure things are functioning right around here. And, uh, you know, sometimes, well, I won't get into that. Sometimes things don't go like the way we want them to, but at least they go. And uh, those people who, uh, for example, I had a young fellow one to, to preach, so we had a youth service and we let him preach, and uh, he misquoted scripture. He took scripture out of context, but he was ministering, and as a result, when he gave an altar call, there were 17 decisions for Christ. And he had no formal education. He was just a drug addict, a former drug addict that God had healed. And he wanted to share Jesus with people. And he did. Baptizing them. This is fellowship. This is fellowship. As we gather together in the name of Jesus, it's a form of fellowship. We have, we have a lot of dinners around this place. One thing I remember, some of the Baptists love to eat. And do a good job. And some of the greatest uh, cooks, like Carmela, was a tremendous cook. And that was her ministry, preparing food. And I know we had uh, a men's breakfast. And Pastor asked a couple of people in the church, ladies, 
if they would fix breakfast for men. We expected about 15 guys. And I never, never had a breakfast like that before. Do you remember, Don Danny? It was chicken. They made a chicken dinner for breakfast and chicken on the bone, and it was good. But that, they were ministering to us. They're letting us know that they love us. And so now we had fellowship. We gathered together. Uh, Sunday afternoon, sometimes we go over to McDonald's, a group of us, and we uh, laugh together, talk together about this, that, and the other, make some comments about the message of the Sunday school lesson, uh, uh, encourage one another in, in what their situation is, and you know, if there's a, some way in their family that's sick or whatever, we let them know that we love them and we talk, and we share it. Right? It's ministry. Now, the next thing is, Oh, I skip one. In making disciples is evangelism. We already talked about it a little bit. It's coming out. And to evangelize everybody. Okay. Now, once we evangelize them, then we baptize them. And we teach them to do things. We kind of covered all those, so I'm going to just move on past them to the next part. And I see where Exodus 28 come in is because uh, that's an old slide and I should have taken that off because it's on this slide too. And I didn't put one up there. So we buy the five instructions for the church is love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, go make disciples, baptize them, teach them. So we have worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, and discipleship. And uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, a priority order. Of course, worship probably is a priority, but the other things, uh, they all follow in our lives. Now, the church exists to do several sort of things. Now, somebody read for Psalm 34, verse 3. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Okay, so this is worship, exalting our master, lifting him up. Again, the song that I love you, Lord. You know, the cross before me, the world behind me. Uh, the different gospel songs, I like some of those that we sing. And we magnify the Lord. What does it mean to magnify the Lord? What is the word? Well, what's the word magnify? Make bigger. Pardon? Make it bigger. Make it bigger. So as we magnify the Lord, then we make him, we say things about him that people can see him, perhaps in a different light. Uh, so we get, as we magnify him, we lift him up, we make him bigger. You know, uh, there's something about a, a, a kid and a grandkid in a sports game. Uh, a kid is the strikeout king. And I heard, uh, I saw a lot of movie. I thought, well, that's great. Uh, and his grandfather was going to stand and told his hey, neighbor, that's my grandson. And the guy said, yeah. he's never hit the ball. And then he grabbed all his jets, but you ever see a swing like that? He's got a swing, he can let swing that. He ever makes a connection. That's gone over the wall. So he was finding something positive about him. So, but exhaust him. We need to exhaust the Lord. I, Lord, I lift your name on high. That's a, one of my favorites. And as we exalt the Lord in praise, uh, there are several different uh, psalms that come to mind. How great thou art. It's, I don't know if you heard of a, a group of men, about 5,000, standing on their feet in a football stadium and singing, How great thou art. Man, that, that's people around that stadium knew. That God is real, that He would work in the lives of those men in that stadium. So magnify, exalt Him, bring attention, make it 
clarify who he is and, and what he's doing. Now, we're to celebrate God's presence. Again, we're to exalt him. Psalm 122, verse 1. So I'm going to read that for us. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. So I was glad. I was glad. You know what? I, I became a Christian because someone invited me to church. And that's a consequence. Uh, just a few weeks later, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in fact, it was uh, 64 years ago today that I was invited to that church. I remember because it was, I should have been 64 days tomorrow that I went there. I go over the whole country and I saw fireworks from Philadelphia to San Francisco. All the way across the nation, you look down at all these different towns, you see the fireworks going on. Sure looks different from up there at 30,000 feet. But they invited me to the Lord. They told me about Jesus. They said, you know, why don't you come to church with us on Sunday? And so my brother and I, we did. And then on August 21st, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Two weeks later, my brother surrendered his life to the Lord. But as we lift up and as we acknowledge God's presence, what is that song, Holy Spirit? Uh, you're welcome in this place. I don't know if you've ever sung that chorus, but I was good in the middle. And we need to invite Christ and we need to acknowledge him. You know, it's nothing like uh, a man coming home from a trip, uh, whatever business, or uh, out with the guys fishing, come home, and the kids meet him at the door, and they say, hey, Daddy, we're glad to home. And he just walks on the by. Or maybe you know, there are two that he'll give him a hug, and the third one, you know, he'll just shine them off. We need to acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Where it is me, I will follow. It's a beautiful song. And we need to uh, acknowledge him. You know that he's there. And I remember being in an accident, and that I knew as a believer that the guys in that group college age guys, uh, my brother and I were in the group, and they and had some kids from our church, you know, youth rally, and the Lord walked over us and protect us, where uh, we could have had a serious accident and walk over the uh, side of this street. Now we are to communicate God's word. Now that's evangelism, communicating God's word. Now, On Sunday morning, we got a pastor that pulled a lot of scripture. He put the bump on, on the overhead so we can see him, and so we can read it for ourselves and we can go back on his talking and see what he's talking about in this verse or that. But so post all that he did, he just put scripture up there and then paused and uh, maybe even read it or have a congregation read it together and then not make any comments on it. He's just sh sharing it. No idea what the connection is between that verse of scripture and uh, what the message is about. What is he trying to get? The idea is communicate. And sometimes uh, we have a lack of communication. And Daniel and I were kind of talking about that earlier today. Well, sometimes we see a lack of communication, and but we need to be able not only to put the word out there, but we need to make sure that people we're talking with understand it. For example, the Bible says we're all in sin to come short of the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? So he asked the person, uh, is lying with sin. And most people will say, 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I start writing a lie that would make it a sin. So then I ask him, hey, have you ever lied? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, then that makes you a sinner. And Jesus Christ is coming to save sinners like you and me. So we help them to understand what the verse is saying, what it's all about. Acts 20, verse 24 says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So he's testifying, he's sharing it, he's helping people to understand it. And I like the sign on the gate. This is, as we're pointing out, they were entering into our mission field. And that's true. That's where our mission field is. And we need to be out there sharing Jesus. Not just going door to door, because there's more to it than that. But there's that person in the grocery store that's there. I know uh, Mary likes to minister to kids. And we'll go to a restaurant or someplace, and she's got those Tootsie Pops that she passes out. And this is an expression of love of Jesus. I see she might say something like, your children have been good and very quiet. Maybe they have. And then these parents say yes. I don't think anybody's turned it down yet, have they? Uh, some Adventists children cannot have sugar. Oh. Only a few. <coughs> Only a few. I was asked the parents yeah. first. But it, it's letting them know. And if you give this a dollar or someone on the street, well, you say, I give him this to you. And then even Jesus, because he loves you. And so we minister in his evangelism. We're to communicate God's word. Acts 1 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and up to the uttermost part of the earth. So this is Christ speaking, Acts 1 8, telling them that they're going to have a ministry. And he said, but you shall receive power, that you will, and as you will receive an anointing, you will receive a strength. And I know my own, my own self, that when I was a young person, uh, I went to all the dances at junior high and high school. I never missed one, but I never danced. I was too shy to ask a girl to dance. And I remember certain girls asking me, and I would, no, 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 no. And it's just because I was shy. But now, as you experience, it's kind of hard to get me to shut up sometimes because the Lord has broken that and uh, he's enabled me to speak up for Jesus Christ. And I know that because I was a Christian, I, when I lived in Sider, uh I saw some things that were wrong in, in, in the local government. And I got involved in politics. As, as a Christian, we need to stand up for what's right and let our leadership know, hey, what you're doing is not right, it's wrong. And so I got involved in it, and as a consequence, I lost my job. But that's another story, because as soon as those guys in city council faced a recall election and were recalled the next day, I had the city manager call me and ask if I wanted my job back. So, uh, still we stand up and we do uh, help the birds, but we let them know. And part of that, I'm not sure I'm going to say how to do it, but we had an election coming up. We need to get out there and we need to vote. If you're not registered, do it. Get out there, vote, and express. All I might say was, if you vote, vote, then you have no right to complain. I don't know if that makes sense to you. If you vote, vote, you have no right to complain. Now, if the church exists, 
just you incorporate it all the time. What does it mean to incorporate? It means to bring together. It's one, doesn't it? A woman does that when she uh, makes cookies. Uh, she incorporates the ingredients and brings them together. And they have an effect one on the other. You know, you've got to put a certain amount of salt in there. And you be careful with the sugar. And if you get the right ingredients and put them together, you have cookies or cake or whatever. But it says, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Well, into the family. They need to uh, do that. You know, when a pastor uh, asks people to pray, and then uh, he acknowledges them, and, and then and he prays for them. And so we need to accept people. I know in, in one church in Sanger, or one they call it Chaka, the old shoe, that there was a Spanish speaking church there. And the pastor was very strong in evangelism. He was a Seventh God pastor, and he was in his late 60s. And uh, he would go out and he would find these kids on the street, the gang members, and he'd minister to them. And on Sunday morning, uh, they'd show up at our church. And some lady that had been mugged the week before would recognize one of these guys. And say, well, what's he doing here? We don't want this guy in our church. And they have a problem because these kids are coming and they would respond to an altar call and they reach into their pockets and they pull out their uh, 357 and lay it along the altar or the 38. One young man reached into his trousers and pulled out a shotgun, and a sawed off shotgun, and laid it on the altar. These are street kids, street, street kids who found Christ. They were incorporated in the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, uh, that pastor used our baptistry uh, two different times in about a six months period. And each time he baptized at least 50 gang members who come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know there were some people in church who wanted to fire their pastor for having those kids in the church. The neat thing was, it wasn't just the guys. There were married couples in that group. And a husband and wife would be baptized together. That's a beautiful experience. But they were welcoming all these gang kids into the body of Christ. They were acknowledging them. They were letting them know that uh, they had worth. Amen? You know, we need to let them know that they have worth. That they are to be an asset to our body. And I can remember uh, sometime later that uh, this one youngster, uh, he came to me because we had films at our church every Friday night, or one Friday night out of the month, and it was uh, end time films and movies. And uh, he came, and one day after we got done coming out the altar, he said, Brother Jim, I have a problem. I said, well, what is that? What could be your problem? He said, well, all my life I was told to hate white people. And so I got a problem that I don't really like other people, and I know I'm supposed to love them and let the God, let God do work in my heart, but I'm having trouble loving them. So I want you to pray for me that the Lord will help me to love them and to uh, uh, reach out and minister to them. And his name was Danny. He was about 22 or 23. And he used to stand on the street corner and sell drugs. But the last time I saw him was standing outside the bar pharmacy there on the main street downtown in Sanger. And he was selling something else. He was sharing Jesus Christ. He was preaching on the corner and telling his testimony of Christ had done for him. So he was evangelized. He was communicating God's word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we are to uh, 
invite them all in again Ephesians 2 19 said now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the house of God so they're part of us and I saw a uh, I think it was a TikTok thing the other day where uh, this uh, little boy uh, it was his birthday I had hung up two pinatas there like an archway in the hole and they were celebrating his birth and his birthday and they flung in holes now you've got two pinatas one says you're going to go to Disneyland and the other says you're going to join our family be adopted so whichever pinata you hit and break and it falls down that's what you're going to get and so they he gave him, uh, I don't know if it was a broom or something, anyhow. And he knocked down uh, the Tanyata to go to Disneyland. And they took his blindfold off. So that's what you get. But would you like the other one? And it's the same being adopted. And so he kind of looked around. He, he didn't want to bleed. And all of a sudden he caught on. And this little guy is about eight or nine. He finally caught, caught on. I'm going to be adopted. I'm going to become part of this family. And we need to accept those people around us as part of the body of Christ and to uh, let them come in. So then we are to disciple them. And uh, that means to educate and for maturity. Ephesians 4 13 says, Till we all, be, all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we are to minister to them, help them learn God's ways of doing things so that they can truly serve the Lord and to be like Jesus. That's the whole idea. That's that we are to become more like Jesus every day. And it's amazing how some of those young people pass us along the way and uh, get further along in their relation with Christ. But I'll tell you something. Uh, there are times, you know, I love the prayer of the elders and the deacons in the church. I love it when they pray for me. But there's something about some kid or young lady or also dad who go through seeing Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They just have an encounter with God. And when they come and pray for me, wow, that's something different. And I remember this one guy. I was in county jail. And uh, we're talking about 1992. And we had a young guy in there. He was what we call a border brother. He was uh, a guy. He was a, we call him the illegal aliens. And so he didn't have paperwork. He'd come across the river and come in up through from Texas and ended up in uh, Fresno. But in the course of his incarceration, he received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Now here's a guy who's known the Lord for just a couple of months. And I'm being transferred to someplace else. And they, when he found out, when they called my, man, my name, they, they tell you to roll up. That means you're moving to a different location. And so I would roll up, and as I went towards the gate, waiting for someone to come and unlock it, so I'd go to wherever I was going. And he'd come to me, and say, oh, Brother Jim, Brother Jim. And I can't say it like he did. There was so much tenderness and love in his voice. And he prayed something that this effect. Now, Father, this is Brother Jim. He's your son. He's part of the family. And we take care of family. Please take care of my brother Jim. Watch over him and protect him. And that, there was such a sincerity in his voice. That prayer had a greater effect me, on me than the prayer of some of the elders of church. But he had a fresh encounter with God. He had a fresh realization of who God is. And he recognized him. And now he's growing in the body of Christ. And he 
You know, here I am. Because a lot of times in the prison systems, those guys and the white guys don't get along. They have their own little clique. And each ethnic group has their own little clique. And you've got to get along with one of them. The group I was supposed to be part of is called the uh, Woods. And they kind of color our skin. Reminds me, or reminds me of the of a tree from which we go down. But they call us the Woods. So you have to fit in somewhere. And of course, I fit in. You know, Woods are part of them, but I was part of a Christian group. That was there. We prayed together. We studied the word together. And the idea is that we study by the Bible says to show ourselves to be the God of work. He is not to be trained. And so we were there and we ministered to one another and we seen guys grow in Christ uh, the short time they were in that situation. And the idea is we educate them. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God. You know, we need to share with others our experience with the Lord. Now, someone was uh, talking the other day and they asked him, Well, did God ever talk to you? Did you ever hear his voice? And I don't remember where that was we had that conversation. Maybe it was lunch on Sunday. But did you ever heard God's voice? And I said, praise the Lord, I have. And he told me not to go this way. Don't go that way. Go this way. And there was something or someone on my path that he wanted me to connect me with. But we need to educate them. You know, when our kids are little, uh, we can make decisions for that. And what we're having spaghetti for dinner tonight. No, we're not having meatballs. We're going to do this. Uh, what television program are we going to have? You're going to watch this program and not that one. We direct them and we kind of control the lives. And sometimes we kind of do that with a new believer. And we do it uh, in a fatherly way or brotherly way. But sometimes we become overbearing and expect too much time. But realize that it's something along the line. You've got to make your own decisions. Make your own decisions. And you tell the kid, uh, that's hot sauce. Uh, you don't want to drink it. It's too hot. And the idea is that somewhere along the line, they have to learn to say, I wonder if it's hot or not. Take a taste. Maybe it's not hot to them. I've had uh, people, uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters, say, well, you sure you want that? This is hot. I said, yeah. Is it the hottest one? Yeah. You know, such as Lady Day, of course, it's your baby. Make that hot salsa. And it's really great. And uh, we're going to pause here. Uh, we've got about another 20 minutes, but we'll pick up next week right here where we left off. It's a, a fly 21. That's a good one. Another 20 minutes. So with that, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for each of you tonight. We thank you for each person that's here, each person that's been at home watching on TV and the internet. We ask, Lord, that you would remind us of the verses and the thought and ideas behind those verses that we might bring glory and honor to you. And we pray, Lord, for some folks that are not here tonight, and they're going to have something else to do. They got our one sister's going working with the kids, which is a unique ministry. And so we just ask that you really be with us, uh, be with the arms, just watch over them, especially Brother Arms, as fragile as he is, just do work in their lives. And Lord, let's make the word tonight become alive and live to us. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless you.